Hello everyone, my name is Paul Sohn and I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Calling In Career Initiative and as an adjunct professor at the Kroll School of Business. Today I want to talk about a question that many of you may be asking yourself. What is my unique calling in life? I remember graduating from college, getting into my dream job, working for a Fortune 50 company. My friend said, Paul, you finally made it. You achieved the American dream. But after a few months into my job, I started to feel the sense of emptiness in my heart. I thought that if I got into my dream job, that I would feel this indescribable sense of happiness and fulfillment, but it failed to deliver. So I thought to myself, is this really all there is? Unfortunately, things didn't get better and I was feeling more depressed. And I remember just one day on my knees praying to God, God, what is happening with my life? Why do I feel so empty? Why do I feel like there's something missing? As I was making that prayer, I realized that God was saying to me, Paul, you've been asking the wrong questions all your life. And that's when I realized that everything in my life was about what I wanted, the college I wanted to get into, the job I wanted to have, the city I wanted to live in, but never once did I ask God, God, what is your plan for my life? So since then, I've been on this wild journey of living out my calling. Maybe you're asking the same question yourself. Why am I here at Biola University? Why am I pursuing this major? What is God's plan for my life after graduation? Let's face it. These questions are, are real challenging questions to answer, especially during these trying times. In fact, in 2020, we've seen that many job offers have been canceled. In-person classes have been canceled. Sporting events have been canceled. Weddings canceled. But your calling has not been canceled. In fact, Romans 11.29 says that for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Or in the message version, it says that God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty, never canceled and never rescinded. The good news is that our calling has a lifetime warranty with God. But it's one thing to know that you have a calling, but quite another thing to actually know what it actually is. In my interaction with students, I've seen that there's a major distortion of what calling actually means. Some of you may view calling as a job. Others may hear the word calling and, and think it's only reserved for those who are in ministry. Or others, calling is a luxury reserved only for the privileged. Now, these are just some of the myths that have often have distorted our understanding of calling. So let me just share a couple of ways on how to rethink your calling biblically. So first, let me define what I mean by calling. Calling is God's personal invitation to work on his agenda by unleashing your unique design in ways that are eternally significant. Now, I know that could be quite a mouthful, so let me unpack this definition in three important points. First, calling is not from you. Instead, your calling is from the caller. This is an incredibly important concept because in the Western world, we have bought into this lie that we are the caller. In other words, we can become whatever we put our mind to be, that we are the captain of the ship, the master of our fate. But before you are called to something, you are called to someone. Calling isn't something you create or choose. Your calling must come from the outside. And the good news is that our caller is not ultimately our parents. It's not our culture. It's our, not our society or our friends. But our caller is the living, almighty, sovereign God. It is the creator and the author of your life who has called you and appointed you to be where you are today. He has invited you to join him on this grand mission of redeeming and restoring our world. So while we can soak on this good news that God is our caller, if we're honest, we often struggle discerning and, and listening to the voice of our caller. Jesus said in John 10, that I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He goes before them 
and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. So the truth is we can listen to the voice of the good shepherd, but unfortunately we're, we're living in a world that is often dominated by noise. According to interruption science, we're interrupted every three minutes from social media, texting to commercials. There are many competing voices that lay false claims to our attention, dictating our desires and instructing our will. So the real question isn't, will I listen, but which voices will I listen to? And a life of calling beckons us that we listen and follow the good shepherd alone. So how do we do this on a practical level? What would it look like to start your day in silence and listen to the voice of God through scripture? Maybe it's setting time intentionally early in the morning or um, during lunch time or before you go to bed. And the key is to know that while it is God who calls us, it is our responsibility to respond to him. Like any healthy relationship, there needs to be a a two-way communication. And as God's children, we need to continually seek to discern his will and his character through scripture and prayer. The second point is this. Not only is your calling not from you, but also your calling is not for you. Instead, your calling is for the service of God's kingdom. Calling is is not about self-development or personal fulfillment. Um, I remember back in college, you know, I tried to fit God into my plan. Even though I was a Christian, I asked God, God, can you, can you give me the high grades? Uh, God, can you give me this prestigious job? God was just the genie in a bottle just to fulfill my desires. But I realized that I was made for God, not vice versa. And the life of calling is about letting God use you instead of you using God for your own plans. Yes, it is important to recognize that God does call us along our giftedness, but the purpose of our giftedness is primarily about service, not selfishness. In our time, the word calling has almost become virtually synonymous with job or occupation, but that's not what it originally meant. A job is a calling only if, someone calls you to it and you do it for others rather than for yourself. Therefore your callings will always lead to the cross. Your calling will involve suffering, sacrifice, and sometimes looking like a fool because this is the path that the savior we follow. I love what David Platt said in a world where everything revolves around yourself, protect yourself, promote yourself, comfort yourself, take care of yourself. Jesus says, crucify yourself. We must listen to the words of Jesus. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So instead of asking the question, what do I want to do in my life? A better question may be what vocational path should I pursue, which I could contribute the most value to those around me. Instead of asking what will make me the most money and give me the most status, perhaps a better question is how with my gifts and personality and passion, can I be of greatest service to others? One way to actually find this is through finding your holy discontent. Your holy discontent is when you look around this broken world and, and, and the question you need to ask yourself is what aspect of this broken world breaks your heart that you want to fix it, that you want to change it, that you want to leave it better for Moses. It was the misery of God's people for David. It was Goliath trash talking God and his people for Nehemiah. It was the people mocking God. So a simple way for you is maybe look for ways in which you can serve those you are in relationship with. How can you serve your family? How can you serve your classmates? your coworkers, what does it look like to bring peace and justice to the world? So we learned that your calling is not from you. It's from your caller. Your calling is not for you, but we're serving your neighbor. Lastly, your calling isn't to success. Instead, your calling is to faithfulness. Our modern culture defines success by how much money we make. 
what our job title is, what our GPA is, how many followers or likes we get from social media. How big are we changing the world or making the mark? So first we need to understand God's picture of success is different than the world's idea of success. Success according to God is spelled faithfulness. In fact, many of the heroes of the Bible are people who didn't have great success. Rather, there are people who stayed faithful to God. Can you imagine Noah preaching for 120 years without ever convincing a single person to believe in God? No doubt he felt like a failure, even though he built a boat. Or Jeremiah, who spent his lifetime trying to call Israel to God, but to no success. Or Elijah, who came off Mount Carmel after a stunning display of God's power, but when Jezebel threatened his life, he just escaped into the wilderness and feeling like a miserable failure. But in God's eyes, they were the most successful people. Why? It's because they were obedient to their calling. They were the real heroes. Here's what I want you to remember. God doesn't call us to succeed. He simply asks us to say yes. It was the call of John the Baptist, Stephen, Paul, and countless martyrs after them. Their short-term outcome was a failure. Many of them never lived to see the fruit of their labor, but God's calling on their lives challenged them to walk through failure and hardships with obedience and unwavering focus on their eternal prize in heaven. As we live faithfully to your calling, it is my prayer that at the end of your life, you will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. In Hebrews 11:6, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So let me be clear that there is nothing wrong with godly ambition or planning for the future. And yes, it is important to excel in your studies and find a competitive job where you can grow, learn and be stretched. But in all of that, make sure your heart is set on faithfully serving the Lord where he's placed you until he makes it clear that he's calling you to something else. So let me draw this to a conclusion. In the season of pandemic, all of us have painfully recognized the brevity of life. In fact, the life we get to live here on earth is truly a gift from God. The question is, what are you going to do with it? It is my prayer that in the midst of the uncertainties of life, that you will fix your eyes on a caller to embrace his calling, to be his hands and feet in redeeming and restoring this broken world. So as you impact the world for the Lord Jesus Christ, that I pray at the end of your life, you will hear these words from God. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for reminding us that, that we have a calling. Thank you for helping us understand that it is you, the caller who calls us. And as we navigate our lives, our careers, that we ask that everything we would do will be about glorifying your name. Help us to remove the idols of our heart so that we can faithfully live out the calling that you have placed in our lives. Pray this in our Jesus name. Amen. And now we get the chance to dive a little deeper with Paul Sohn. So Paul, thanks so much for being here. Um, you talked earlier about being, having worked in a fortune 50 company. I kept wanting to say fortune 500. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what that, that was like for you? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, fortune 500, those are the top uh, largest companies in America based on revenue. So uh, fortune 50 is, top 50 biggest companies. Um, and it was my first full-time job right after college. And I would say it was an interesting experience because that's when I um, experienced my quarter life crisis. <laughs> and uh, for those who don't know what that term means, it's where you have midlife crisis. And then now it's 20 years earlier, right? And <laughs> it's usually in your mid twenties. And that's when I um, was feeling the sense of, emptiness and meaninglessness in my heart and really uh, kind of this existential crisis of trying to figure out, you know, who I am and why am I here and what is my calling? So I, um, at that very moment, it was 
very painful and I didn't know why I was experiencing it. But, um, you know, now in hindsight, I get to see God's hand in all of that. So that, that's been a, quite a blessing. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Um, so you also talked about kind of the idea that the sheep, you know, they know the voice of the shepherd and we have that relationship with God. So how do we know? Because you also talked about all the other voices that we're listening to these days. Yeah. How do we know that we're listening to the voice of God versus the other voices around us? Yeah, that, that is the question, right? Because I think a lot of us today, especially young people are um, living in a culture where there's constant attention, constant noise. And I just think about like the statistics when I read about social media and how that plays a role, right? Um, and how it's, we're saturated with all this type of media. And, you know, if an average young person is spending, you know, three to five hours on social media every day, and they're seeing the highlight reel of all their friends and all their peers, um, in your mind, it's telling you like, what is happening? Like, why, um, am I feeling so much like comparing with my friends mm -hmm. and that's getting into your head, right? So those are some of the noises that I'm talking about. And I think the key thing is to really declutter yourself from all these different notifications and social media, especially in the beginning of your day where you are spending intentional time in prayer and scripture. And without that, we can't really listen. We have to um, practice those, these spiritual disciplines of silence and um, having Sabbath and slowing down to really learn what is God trying to tell me. And, you know, prayer and scripture is primarily the way that God would speak to us. Yeah, yeah. for sure. That's great. Um, what about if our calling seems to be in conflict with some barriers like finances or family situation? Um, you know, it sounds great. Like, okay, this is the calling, but what do we do then if there's kind of conflict there? Yeah, that's, that's, I think where the challenge is because I think, there's going to be financial problems when you run into living out God's um, calling in your lives. There may be different uh, voices of your parents. This is something I hear a lot from students um, where your parents want you to do something else than you've envisioned. And, right. and maybe that's where God may be calling you. And that I think is key is to understand that ultimately we only get to live one life. Right. And, um, I just shared a quick story that I uh, heard and really stuck with me. And it was this nurse who's worked at an ICU unit for over 25 years, um, taking care of patients who are dying. And she wrote a book uh, about the questions that she got to ask, what is the greatest regret that you have in life? And the number one um, answer that she got from these patients was, I never had the courage to live the life that I want. And I think that's something to think about because this time that we have here on earth is way too short. And if we're going to be pleasing others, if that becomes our main goal, or if it's about uh, just living in this kind of scarcity or poverty mindset, then it's going to prevent us from fully stepping into the fullness of God's calling. So ultimately it's understanding who God really is and knowing how big he is and how sovereign he is and that trusting him, that he's the one who will provide. Mm -hmm. He's the one who will lead us. And without that, um, it's so easy to be wrapped up in fear, right? It's so easy to be wrapped up with all this anxiety of trying to do it in my own power to, to take care of my life. But it, I think first and foremost, it, it requires us to surrender ourselves is, and to look, look at our, um, our, our gaze on Jesus for he is the one who is calling us mm. and trusting him. Yeah, that's powerful. Wow. Um, yeah, you know, I'm graduating this year and thinking about career and uh -huh. future jobs is really, you know, prominent on my mind. So what would you say about how does career fit into vocational calling and what's something practical that we can do to discern that? Yeah, so I mean, when I talk about calling, it's much a bigger concept than your job, right? So you're called to your family, your human family, um, as a, as a son, daughter, as a you know, sibling, you're also called to your church where you're called to serve. 
using your gifts, your call to, as a citizen, um, you know, how do we engage in politics? That's a part of our calling. And then also we're called to our work, our vocational calling. So first it's important for us to understand just kind of the extent of calling is so much more bigger than just a job. But since, you know, you're a student and you're thinking about graduation <laughs> soon. So let's talk about vocational calling and career. And I think one way to really discern that is to understand that when God calls us, um, especially thinking about Moses at the burning bush, you know, we pray to God and we read the scripture and we're like, God, just, I just need to hear your audible voice. Tell me what to do <laughs> and I'll just know what it is. Right. And we pray and pray and um, nothing really happens, right? And we feel kind of depressed and dejected. But I think the key is to understand that when God calls us, he uses what's called our unique design, our original design, that he has gifted us with our talents, with a set of temperaments and personality. Um, he has given specific passions, and desires in our heart, and also our life experiences. So for me, the model is kind of the sweet spot model. So there's four elements and there's an intersection of those four and that's the sweet spot. Mm. So if you're applying for a job, yeah, it's important to look for what kind of, you know, reputation it is and how much money you may be making. But right. if that's the only factor that you base on, it's going to be difficult for you. Rather look at understanding your personality. Look at how does it fit into my passions and desires God has given me? How does it fit with my own giftedness? And also, how is it consistent with my life experiences? Mm. So I think those are some key factors. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, another thing is just when we think about majors, um, how does picking a major kind of intersect with living out our calling? And what if like we feel like we're being called to something outside of our degree? Yeah. Well, actually studies show that I think 70 to 80 percent of people who graduate from college end up doing something that is not their major. <laughs> so I feel as students, there is such a pressure, like I have to get the right major. If, if I don't, I've somehow failed. And, you know, um, first of all, I just want to relieve the pressure for <laughs> anybody who's experiencing that. It is important, though, to explore and experiment in this time in college. And that's where I would say, as you look at your own giftedness and your own sweet spot and your own passions, choose one that you feel like where you can best serve God and that gives a sense of this life in you. Um, and to know that you're building more importantly, transferable skills, mm. right? And these skills are going to transfer after graduation into all these other jobs, whether it's building leadership skills, whether it's building emotional intelligence, um, learning how to network, and build relationships with people. All of these are critical part, regardless of what major you choose. So right. um, just be open to the idea that if you end up working at a, a job that is not completely aligned with your major, that's also fine. And God uses all of that uh, for our good, so. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This is just such a valuable conversation for all of us as college students. So it's great to have you. Yeah, my pleasure. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.